Okay, so today, because it, uh, in the previous week, like the last week, we actually cover until 4.4, .4, right? Like, uh, uh, we just, just we stopped before the more, before the model concerns. So we actually covered, covered the, uh, not, no, we actually cover until, uh, up to the 4.3, right? And then uh, it's time for us to cover, uh, starting from the 4.4, .4, like the assessing model accuracy. So maybe, maybe from now on, I'm gonna start. So let me share my screen just. Okay. Hold on. Uh, not, not, not this one. Okay. So can you see the screenshots? Uh, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So last week actually we covered about the just kind of very simple definition and some 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 of the characteristics of the simple linear and multiple linear regressions. Yeah, as we all know, actually simple linear regression is a uh, just kind of a regression model with the one predictors and then try to identify the statistical relationship between one that that predictor and the response variable and then the other one is a multiple linear regression is a kind of like a, uh, we actually have a model to when we have a more than more than two predictors and then try to try to understand the relationship between those two those more than two predictors and the response variable. And also we also simply cover about, all, about the interaction effect. Like uh, when, we, when, we have, when we also have a kind of a effect of the one predictor gonna be, uh, gonna be also depend on the value of the other predictors. So in that case, we actually think about the interaction effect. So we actually cover until that part. And then today we're gonna start about the 4.4 .4 and then I'm gonna try to finish the rest of the chapter four. But before doing that, I have to apologize for you guys because during this week I was so busy, so busy and then I was not prepared to the, this presentation, but I actually studying it. So maybe in the, from the 4.6 to 4.8, I'm gonna try to use the use the just the textbook as it is rather than the my presentation slides. My presentation slides only have a 4.4 .4 and 4.5 right now. So that's the thing. So and then okay, so in 4.4, .4, we actually talking it the book actually talk about the, how we can evaluate the model accuracy, which means what is the best what is the how we can can we obtain the, the best model. So that means which model is the best because when, whenever we have a kind of a, uh, the, as, we, as we cover last time, whenever we have uh, these kind of, uh, you know, some there is uh, some patterns, right? Like this. Actually, there is a, Actually, in in infinite line of regression line, possible regression line, right? That can be have a have a some some of the like uh, I would say uh, like a least square. Uh, no, no, no. I mean the ordinary ordinary least square, right? Like a like an error term. But the thing is. What is the what is the linear regression goal? Is we actually try to find between x and y. We actually try to find ordinary least square, right? Which means we actually have a line that has the minimum minimum error term error, right? So that actually that model is gonna be considered as a 
the best model, which is the uh, model with a very good goodness of fit. So to to find out the, the best model, we actually uh, use the, this RMSC, like a, like a root mean square error, right? Or, and then we can also try to testing the cost validations. So using the using the train function in a care package, we already know about the, this train function before we already cover it. And then we actually try to develop the, our model, which is uh, at the bottom right like this. So SESID is a kind of uh, just kind of a reproducibility purposes. We actually set up this one. Like, a, like a, this one actually allows us to the, whenever we learn the, learn the code at the bottom right here, we, we always get the same, same result. Without this one, we don't have any same result. Even if we have a same train model, depending on the, depending on the, the sampling, the uh, resampling kind of approaches, we always have a different, different result if we don't set up this kind of a reproducibility kind of functions. I think everyone are hope to familiar with this function. But anyway, so by using the this train function, we actually try to make a formula like this, which is the single linear regressions. And then our data is the Amos train, which is the Amos housing data set in Boston. And then uh, what we all need to do is uh, try to set up the method is the LM, which is a linear model. And then our train control variable is the method is the cross validations. And then a number, what the number means is that this is the actually sampling number. Sample, uh, sampling, like a number of iteration about the sampling. So we actually try to testing the sample Sample number one through number ten, which from by by using the sum of the sampling method, and then using the this Amos train data set, we actually randomly randomly get the sample to the ten ten different sample by using the train data set. Maybe bootstrapping or maybe k uh, k nearest and labor kind of a sampling process we actually get a sample one through 10. And then by using those things, we're gonna try to train our model by using the train function. And then at the bottom, here is the, here is the result, right? So like, like you see here, we actually have a cross validated, which is the tenfold, which means that K K, K, K sampling is a 10 sampling, 10 fold, 10 fold sampling process. And then our sample size is uh, almost a constant, except for the first one, but almost a constant, pretty same, no matter, uh, regardless of the sampling size. And then our sampling result is the, like uh, this square error term is uh, 56,644.76. And then R squared is a point, uh, point five one, and then uh, MA is also kind of another, another error term, kind of a, a calculation method called mean. I think it's a, it's a mean average error, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Mean average error. Yes. Yeah, mean average error, and then but the thing is, we usually this one is RMSE going to be the more like a standardized kind of error term. So we are actually looking at this one, but depending on our model or maybe you can also check out this one, but it's up to you or some kind of research context. And then when we go down to the bottom here, it said actually textbook interpret uh, this kind of a result, right? The answer. So, uh, I, yeah. I, also, I also have a comment on the RMSE. Uh -huh. And why, why is it uh, convenient, you know, to use that metric mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. instead of the MSC, which is the mean square error? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons is that the mean square error, the units, mm -hmm. okay, the units of measurement are mm -hmm. square. 
just oh. like analog to the variance, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that the variance is square, right? Yeah. So in order to you know uh, get a better interpretation mm. of that unit of measure, mm -hmm. you have to then you know apply the square root so yeah. that you have the units in the same you know in the same plane, the same uh, uh, you know in the, in, in in the same uh, uh, measurement measurement uh, like the you know the the predictors uh, the, the sorry the, the response. Okay, mm -hmm. so for example, right now the the units here are dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Dollars. So mm -hmm. if you use the mean square error without the root, without the square mm -hmm. root, mm -hmm. you are going to get dollars to the square. Yeah. That's, that's, right. that's going to be the error. Okay. Yeah. So when you take the root, then you equalize the units of measure to the response. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. you are talking, you're talk, talking in the same plane, in the same, you know, uh, uh, me measurement, okay? And that, and that is, you know, that usually is very, uh, uh, very important to uh, mm. to realize, okay? Yeah, yeah, right. It's a very good point because, yeah, like like you said, RMSC like by by looking the dead value from the MSC, mm -hmm. we can actually get the real your value right. kind of thing, and then uh, it is very straightforward to interpret the result. So that's the yeah, reason it's, why it's, it's yeah. analog. It's analog to why do we use the standard deviation instead mm -hmm. of the variance, right? Yeah, yeah, right. The, the variance is the measurement, right, of of, of, mm -hmm. of spread of the distribution. But mm -hmm. the problem is that the variance is square. Okay, yeah, so right, you have to then bring it to the same units. So that's mm -hmm. why you use the standard deviation. It's the same mm -hmm. concept. Same concept. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the reason why we actually get uh, these kind of uh, interpretation results at the bottom. So like uh, interpretation is uh, whenever we have a kind of an unknown data, the prediction is going to be the on average about the $56,000 off from the actual state prices. So that means like uh, when this one, this maybe this point is the kind of uh, actual price. And then uh, maybe there might be the Kind of like a, you know, negative 56410 or maybe positive 51410 kind of a range, you know. So, and then uh, whenever whenever those kind of uh, prices are, those prices actually around this area. That's the prediction is about. So it's uh, actually pretty poor more than compared to the cause of right. cause of $56,000 <laughs> differences is a kind of like a very, very poor model because mm -hmm. it does not, it does not provide us any kind of insight or any kind of accurate prediction to the housing, housing prices. Is a too, too, too many off kind of differences. So <laughs> it's a kind of poor model. So to do so that the, uh, due to the that kind of region, actually this will, testing the another the other uh the other two model gonna be tested so the other one is the uh, actually in 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 here as you can see the the other is the kind of a multiple multiple linear regression for the adding the year build and then and then the the last one is uh, we actually we actually put everything every variable to predict the sales price, right? And then we actually testing, testing those performance measurement results here like this. Here is a sample to the list and then try to do the summary. It's just kind of simple by using the train functions, we just keep developing the, our possible modeling alternatives and then we actually try to list up each, each model like this, and then using the these samples kind of functions and then a summarize summary functions, we can get the result, right? At the bottom like this. This is also, this is a slightly different compared to the book because uh, um, how we can get the sampling is a different actually. 
So in here, actually, we actually compare to the model one and two and three. So as we can see, we when we when we looking at this RMSE value, uh, RMSE value, like a root mean square error. So we can say that okay, in the model one, which is our poor one, it that actually have a fifty six thousand six hundred forty four, but that actually able to go down to the forty one. 1697 or 91 kind of a differences. It is still poor, but model three compared to the model one, model three actually have some improvement, right? Because it's a, a little bit small error term. So, so you, if we use the model three, our prediction gonna be a little bit more accurate compared to the model one, but still it is quite poor. Even if we can learn the model with the, all the predictor variable included in the table. So that's the kind of kind of thing in here. And then that's the how we can testing about the, our our accuracy about the model in like what how how accurate our production, our pred, uh, prediction will be. Uh, when we train the, our model and then uh, we can, when we predict the, some values from our model. So actually, as we can see here, we, when we try to conducting the linear regression model, there is actually several model assumption, which is the concerns we have to keep in mind. Textbook actually, actually mentions uh, some kind of a four different four concerns, I would say four assumptions we have to keep in mind when we try to conduct the linear regression model. So first one is a kind of what is called a linear relationship. That means actually linear regression model has an assumption saying that the, there is the linear relationship between the response and predictor variable. That's the very basic, fun, basic assumption of the linear regression. But sometimes, there is a always, always there is always a lot of cases that we don't have any kind of linear relationships, like uh, like uh, some pre, some for some predictors and and the response variable, those relationships gonna be the nonlinear, like uh, like uh, maybe some kind of a quadratics or maybe QB kind of like this kind of a very irregular kind of a nonlinear relationship gonna be happen. So in that case, what's the solution to do that is uh, as we can cover in the in the chapter two and three, we actually apply to the transformation to the response or predictors. Usually the most common use about the transportation is the log transportations. Uh, trans uh, not transportation, transformation. I'm sorry, <laughs> transformations. So that means maybe we can take the log y, or maybe we can take the log x1, et cetera. And then this trans transformation allows us to get to the somewhat the linear regressions between the, uh, between the predictors and response variable. So for example, in here, uh, when we, when we looking at the, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, relationship like a scatter plot, we actually found that okay in this case like a year built and the uh, and the sales price, we can actually when we use the year built variable as it is, we actually find found that there is a, some kind of a nonlinear relationship like a curvy line, like this as you can see at the bottom. But to make to try to try to uh, satisfy the assumption of the linear relation, relationship, we actually try to take a log, this one like a log, year built, and then uh, we can somehow get the kind of a very linear line kind of a relationship. So in that case, our model gonna be the sales price equal beta zero, which is the which is the intercept, plus beta one log year built. 
So in that case, this one is actually what is called a natural, uh, natural log. So how we can interpret the result is maybe when we try to when we try to do the kind of a kind of a deliberative kind of a functions to these two, we can actually get the kind of a result for the dy, dy and d is the sales price equal beta one year built like this dx and t like this so so based on the, this kind of a, a little bit um complicating the calculations anyway the, the interpretation of the, these kind of a things is actually one unit uh, like a better, better one percent change in year built gonna be cause cause the one unit change in sales uh, in sales price average sales price. You know, that's the how this one gonna be interpreted. Actually, it is not quite straightforward because it's the year bit. Because the year bit is just kind of a counting kind of a variable. But theoretically, how we can interpret the result is the kind of like a, oh not not this one like a one unit one unit change. I'm sorry, one unit change to the year bit is the beta percent unit beta percent change in the in the sales price. I. I don't think I can kind of wake up. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Can too. Uh, yeah. I, I have a comment. If you can go yeah. a little bit up uh -huh. uh, to check the to, to check the function that is creating that uh, uh, uh -huh. the plot. Uh, uh -huh. the log there scale underscore y underscore log 10. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that log is applied to the sale price. Mm. Okay, it, it's not yeah. applied to the year built, mm. and I recognize it because when you go back to the you know to to the to the plot uh, mm -hmm. result, uh -huh. uh, the scale of year built doesn't change, but the sale price the the mm -hmm. the scale of mm. that sale price uh, hadn't mm. changed there. Yeah, okay. yeah, right, right. So 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 in, in, instead of applying the log to the year built. Is applying mm -hmm. the log to the sale price, mm -hmm. which is uh, intuitive because remember that in feature engineering in chapter three, uh, uh, uh -huh. we plot a sale price and it's rightly skewed. In other words, it has uh -huh. some outliers, you know, to the right of the distribution tail. Mm -hmm. So in order to correct that, to make it more Gaussian, more normal, then you apply uh -huh. log transformation uh, to okay. the sale price. Okay. Okay. Just so, make sure that we are in the same, you know, in uh, the same frequency. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so you're saying is our formula gonna be the log sales yeah, exactly. price? Yep. Ah. Uh, okay. And then beta zero plus beta one year build. Yeah. Year build. Yeah. Year okay. build. Is the, is the oh yeah. Thing. Right. Right. It, is yeah. is the log that is applied to the sale price because the yeah, sale yeah. price is the one. That is rightly yeah. skewed, okay, and it's yeah, and it's right. and it's provoking, you know, uh -huh. it's provoking that nonlinear relationship. Yeah, right. Okay, so okay. so so in that yeah, in that case, like a one unit change, one unit change year bit is beta beta percent change in sales price. That's the how how we can settle. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. I just yeah. I actually. At the wrong formula, and then I try to interpret the long interpretation. So it always yeah. happens, you know. <laughs> mm. Okay. Okay. I mean, so, sometimes, uh, so yeah. sometimes you have to transform both. Okay. For example, yeah, you right. see some examples in the gross living area, which uh -huh. also has a skewed distribution. Yeah, that right. You can transform both. Okay. Yeah. But in right. this case, the author is saying, okay, if you transform the sales price, mm -hmm. then you get that linear. Yeah, uh, right, right. Yeah, okay. right. Yeah.
Yeah, that's the thing. Okay, so let's move on. So that's the thing for the linear relationship because of the linear regression is based on the assumption that uh, depend between the predictors and response variable, there is a linear relationship. And then the second one is uh, what is called the constant variance among the residual. That means our error term, variance of the, our error term, like uh, when we thinking about the linear regression formula, like a beta zero plus a beta one, X one plus epsilon, epsilon i in this case, this one actually, when we calculate the, this, the variance, this one, we actually have a, have a constant variable, like a sum of the value for this. But if we don't have a non-constant non variance, which is the, uh, not the heteroscedastry kind of issues, as you can see at the bottom, there is a kind of a fan out kind of a, uh, situations, which means in that case, this is a, what is called a hetero uh, scedacity. That means that there is actually additional ex external factors we did not uh, take take into the account. Because compared to the model, uh, when we looking at the model one for the error term, we actually find that about the this kind of a fan out kind of a situation, which means the heteroscedacity. So that means the variance is not constant. And also there is a, a another unknown, unknown external factors that we didn't include in the model. But when we looking at the model three in here, actually we can see that there is a still kind of outlier in here. But the thing is overall, we actually have a kind of a very constant kind of a variance, right? Residual, which means the residual. So when we try to scale, when we try to get the variance for the this based on the model three kind of plot, our we can actually pretty safe to say about the our model is the kind of like a error term variant variance among the error term is the quite constant because it is a still kind of a, a little bit flat, kind of a randomized kind of a approaches compared to the this banal kind of situations. That's the, what the constant variance among the residual is about. And then our third one is the no oral correlations, which means maybe special oral correlation or temporal oral correlation gonna be happen sometimes when we have a when we have a time series data set, which is the like, for example, when we have a kind of an earthquake kind of a data set, that means that this one is actually time plus the space data, right? Like a space temporal kind of data set. In that case, we actually have a, there is a, some, some kind of a oral correlation effect, which means maybe when we say about the, there is a, like a 3.5 kind of earthquake in the, in the 2000, maybe five, maybe there on, maybe in 2006, maybe there might be the very similar kind of a level of the, this earthquake level in that region. That's the how oral correlated is about. So, and also this is actually oral correlation for the time. When, about the special oral correlations, like uh, in terms of the space, maybe when we thinking about the crime rate, in the neighborhood. So assuming that this is the neighborhood boundary A, and then uh, next to the neighborhood, this neighborhood A, there is a neighborhood B in that case, maybe the crime rate for the neighborhood A is maybe 2.5 per, uh, uh, per year, maybe like a percent or whatever count. In that case, Maybe neighborhood B gonna be maybe 2.3 or 2. Point maybe 7, which is a pretty similar, you know. Actually, in the in case of the space oral correlations, there is actually uh, one principle called the toddler's law. What the toddler's law is about is in geography, there is a toddler's law saying that 
everything is uh, related, okay, in space. But the thing is, the objects that close to each other gonna be the more associated compared to the distance ones. That's the total loss law, okay? Does that make sense? So what's the total loss law yes. saying about yeah in geography is like I said, when the when we have a kind of a neighbors close to the, each other, those are the those neighborhood has a strong relationship compared to the when we compare to the one neighborhood and the, the other, which is the which is the uh, far from the far from each other. Okay. But the basic assumption of the special correlation is everything is the related. But close one is the more related to, to the distance one, distance turn one. That's the total slow. So that's the what, what is called the special oral correlation come from. So in to do that actually book does not cover the how we can we can testing the these kind of oral correlations, which is a very critical because whenever we get the data set, we the first thing we have to figure out, especially for me as the urban planners, we always are thinking about that there is any kind of a neighboring effect in time or space. So we always testing these two kind of situations. So to do that, there is a two possible test, uh, test for the what is called the Dublin Watson test for the special oral correlation, or maybe uh, not the coffee, like a this is a P kind of thing, like a B, it is called about the BP test. So maybe if you can Google that one. So DW test, like a doubling Watson test or a BP test for the oral correlation, these two actually allows us to the testing about the, about the oral correlation effect on, uh, in our data set. So if we have uh, that oral correlation effect, our goal gonna be in the model is that we have to filtering out that effect, which means removing those effects first and then learn the model, okay? So in terms of the special oral correlations, maybe there is a oral, there is a neighboring effect across the space, like, like in this case, like crime rate. We want, what we usually use is that we can actually think about the, maybe special special leg model, special error model, or maybe geographically weighted regressions, or there is a function for the special filtering model. What is the main goal of the all of the, this model is to try to take the, take the neighboring effect into account in our model, and then remove the those effect first, and then learn the model. That's the that's the what is called the special data modeling is about. Special data analysis actually requires us about the removing the neighboring effect first and then run the model. And then how we can remove the those kind of a neighboring effect? There is a several several different type of the model that allows us to do. But the basic one is the we actually try to think about the how we can quantify the neighboring effect but they, that is a more kind of a in detail kind of thing. There is actually called a geographic, geographically weighted matrix, like a GWM. We actually say about, okay, in between A and B and C and D, we actually set up the set up the matrices, A, B, C, D, and then A, B, C, D. Actually, when we try to do the A and B, actually A and B share the boundary, which means one, and then uh, A and C also share the boundary, right? And one, and then a D does not have one, so zero, like this. And then uh, we can actually develop the, this kind of uh, uh, geographically weighted neighboring metrics, and then uh, we use these metrics as a weight to remove the, those neighboring effects. So that's the kind of how we can deal with the oral correlation. Same for the temporal oral correlation too, okay? The main difference between the temporal oral correlation is uh, instead of the neighboring A and B and C and D, there is actually time, time interval, like a, 
like uh, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, etc. Okay. So, okay. So here is uh, some kind of a useful link that the Ricardo shares, and then uh, yeah, just please check out the, yeah. those things. Yeah, as a reference. Yeah, the, there's a case yeah. there on yeah. special correlation for mm -hmm. uh, migration ana analysis of the Italian mm -hmm. population mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. explain some of the relationship between the demographics of each mm -hmm. area and mm -hmm. the propensity of the yeah, yeah. migration. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, also, I was going to comment, uh, uh, let me see. Oh, in the aims. Uh, you know, housing data set. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that you're aware that there's a temporal uh, component, mm -hmm. which is the, mm -hmm. the the year, the year and the months sold of mm -hmm. the unit. Okay, mm -hmm. so you have to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, because of that uh, temporal component, mm -hmm. uh, that you don't, you know, you avoid having uh, autocorrelation. Yeah, okay? right. Which yeah. for a time series is fine. Okay, in fact, in time series, uh, the assumption is that the values are autocorrelated. Okay, mm -hmm. but for the linear regression, multiple regression models, the the temporal uh, autocorrelation it's a no-no. Okay, you know because e each of those uh, residuals have to be uh, independently uh, distributed. But mm -hmm. in the time series, if you switch to a time series, uh, you know. Uh, uh, data set or, or, yeah. or problem, then mm -hmm. the autocorrelation is one of the assumptions. You know, it switches. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, actually, what we when we say about the no autocorrelation in the regression model is actually what what is the basic assumption is that every observations data set is the independent, right? Because uh, because right, right. uh, yeah, independent and then exclusive to one another. You know. So that means one the result of the one observation one observation outcome does not affect to the, the outcome of the, the other observations. That's the basic assumption of the linear regressions. That actually means that the, there is a no autocorrelation among the observations. That's the, how we actually interpret the, these things in the modeling concern. And then uh, we have to keep in mind this kind of effect. Okay. And then the next one is the more observation than the predictor. So that means it is about the sample size. So which means we have to have a more feature or observation data set uh, compared uh, compare to the, our predictors. So that means we have a, at least have a more observation than the number of the predictor, total number of predictors included in the model. So that means if we have uh, like a uh, 30 observation, but our predictor is a uh, 50, in that case, I think that in R, when you use R in this case, maybe you will not have uh, any result. There is actually error sign because predictor has, predictor is uh, more than the actual observation and then uh, LM function does not work in this case. So, and then what about this? Like, uh, when we have observation of the 30, and then uh, when we have a predictor is maybe 15 or 20, in that case, we still, we can learn the model, but the thing is we have a very small sample size. That means we are not make, we do not make sure if that sample size that we can represent the entire population characteristics. In that case, one thing the, we have to consider in after learning the model is the, what is called a sensitivity analysis. What this one is about is the when the when the sample size one sample going to be out or when when the sample size change how how much our our regression coefficients going to be changed in response to the one small change to the our sample. That is what we call the sensitivity analysis. Maybe there is a sm only small changes gonna be happen in the regression coefficients when we changing the, our sample size in this case. 
that means that model gonna be the represents the entire population. That means our sample size can be represents the entire population. So when we have a very small sample size with a with a small predictors in this case, like a second case. It, it is feasible to run the model, but to do, but also we have the testing conducting about the sensitivity analysis to see the changing in the sample size gonna be affect how the changing in the sample size gonna be affect to the changing significant change into the regression coefficients in this case. So that's the kind of thing. And then I personally think that depending on the, I don't know about the about the other academic field, but in the social science, it is a rule of thumb. It is rule of thumb for the sample size is more than 100 to get the generalizable result and then get over with this sensitivity analysis. So that means if we have a sample size at least more than 100 observations, that means it is a kind of a safe to say about the sensitivity analysis, like a, like a gonna be guarantees, or maybe some of the, maybe some are like a 10% or 20% of the populations, depending on the proportion of the sample size, also gonna be used as a rule of thumb. But the thing is, anyway, the thing is uh, in this, the second case, like uh, we have uh, both a small sample size and then a, uh, less than a predictors of the compared to the in depth model cases, we actually conducting the sensitivity analysis should be implemented. So that's the number four. And then the final one is that uh, there is just, a no, uh, yeah. Just a, just a, just a, a brief comment uh, uh -huh. for the sample size, because uh -huh. we're using, we're using machine learning models, uh -huh. maybe not the linear regression in particular, but for example, uh, uh -huh boosting models, tree-based models, and all that, mm -hmm. uh, usually you need a large uh, sample size. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So that the model can learn mm -hmm. uh, most of the rules, okay, mm -hmm. that are governing that particular, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, data set. Mm -hmm. So usually you need, you know, you, you, you need quantity. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that also you can do if you have a small sample size because of the, you know, of the nature of the problem mm -hmm. is that you can use uh, bootstrapping uh, techniques, okay? Mm -hmm. To resample with, mm -hmm. uh, with replacement, mm -hmm. uh, resample that small uh, data set to create a bigger uh, mm -hmm. data set, okay? Yeah, but but uh, I, would, I would like to point out that, that still, even if we can try to do the bootstrapping and then a boot, mm -hmm. like a jackknifing sampling process, to get the right. bigger data set, it is still have a problem. If we have mm -hmm. only small sample size, because there is actually limited kind of cases we can actually draw from the variation of the sample size from the, those small data set. Mm -hmm. So that Correct. means that means that there is actually lack of the variations among the samples, even if we can try to do the Bluetooth checking. So in that case, we have to test, that's the reason why we still need to be testing about the sensitivity analysis to, to get, to prove that our model is gonna be still valid and then our modeling interpretation is still generalizable. Even mm -hmm. if we can, we can get a small sample size, our model is gonna be still generalizable. Cause I understand what you're right. saying, but the thing is our nature of the data set by itself is very limited due to the data limitations. Mm -hmm. Even if we can learn the bootstrapping or jackknifing kind of a resampling, we still need to use the sensitive analysis. To, right. uh, to uh, one, one the yeah. yeah, one doesn't preclude the other. But I want to mention because there are some techniques that you can, you know, improve, right? Your yeah, statistical right. significance, yeah. even Correct. if you have, you know, constraint with yeah. a small sample size. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, right. Like a, you, you're saying is like a like a gradient to boost to kind of a regression model, or maybe penalty, or like regression of our data set uh, model. Those 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 can be maybe less uh less lasso model can be can be done to 
to only for uh, if we have only small sample size, but still it is a good way or desirable to run the sensitive analysis just in case in in our model still reflects the some some kind of a generalizable result in our model. So that's the, my point. So yeah, I also agree with that because that boosting kind of a model actually allows us to uh to get the get the better better robust model but still our data set by itself is quite limited we still need to learn the sensitive analysis because in the in the academic literature when you take out the academic research or literature when we have a there is a lot of a situation where you have a very limited sample size and then in that case we actually do the sensitive analysis, even if we actually try to make a make a bootstrapping sampling method. And sometimes also there is a kind of a situation we cannot learn the bootstrapping kind of approaches. For example, like a medical kind of research, it is very dangerous to arbitrary get the arbitrary sampling process to get the generalizable result. Those area only cares about the actual observation data mm -hmm. for the scientific region. So in that case, bootstrapping is not allowed. Mm -hmm. So okay. in that case, in that case, no yeah, in that case, those kind of area in the medical science or public health kind of science, they are very sensitive about the sampling. So they always, they always have a very limited experimental result depending on the how many participants in there or how many experience they actually iterated based on the same protocol. And then they actually get the result of the, some modeling. They always testing about the sensitivity analysis to thinking about the, even if we remove the sum of the sample from the, our observation sample, our model is still valid, that means we, there is a no significant change in the regression coefficients. Especially we, when we try to testing the pill or some kind of medicine test, it is very dangerous to resampling, get the resampling through the bootstrapping in the medical science. So in that case, there is a cases for the bootstrapping or resampling method can be, cannot be allowed. So, but anyway, yeah, it is a good. Yeah, it is good comment, and it is very good. Yeah, point, the, good the, point. The, yeah. Yeah, I only mention it because it's something that statistically, uh, yeah. you, can, you can use. Okay, yeah, but depending right. on the domain, yeah. maybe there's a constraint in terms of the medical field that you know they yeah. don't allow that. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you can you yeah. have to work with that we have. Yeah. But for example, in some of the machine learning methods that we're going to be studying, especially mm -hmm. when we go to deep learning. Mm -hmm. uh, you need a large sample. Uh, yeah, you cannot right, apply, right. for example, a deep learning model to yeah. a small sample. It's not, yeah. it's, 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 it's not uh, wise uh, to do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And then also number five is the kind of, uh, there is a no and little multi-correlary, which means if there is a, a lot of uh, correlations between the, between the predictors, that might be the problem. So, so we actually try to thinking about the, there is a no multi problem among the predictors. That's the, what we actually know about. So we actually pretty understand what this one is about. And then uh, how we can identify the multi problem is maybe core functions or BIF function. This, these two function actually allows us to, to get uh, identifying the which variables have a multi corollary problem, especially for the in the VIF factors. Uh, this one actually says about the, there is a, maybe there is a predictor variable whose VIF factor is the more than five or more than 10, sometimes very loose case, which means that that predictor is gonna be multi corollary problem in the linear regression situation. We can, there is a, in R, there is a function called BIF, BIF functions by using these BIF functions. And then inside the, this, inside the that parenthesis, there is the model, model object gonna be inserted. And then whenever you run the command, 
uh, are going to be generating the BIF, BIF value. And then uh, usually when you get the BIF value more than five or 10, that means uh, that predictor has uh, some kind of a multi-corneality problem. So that's the kind of things in here. And then these are the kind of a, a little bit kind of a R code, try to cause validation and then the multi corneality things like uh, when we have a too strong correlated variable, that means that actually distorts our P values and then a T statistic because both are then the related together. So that means we, this, this is a very doubtful kind of a result. So we have to remove, we have to think about the, in this, in this case, we have to think about the deleting this one or this one to get the, get the valid model. So that's the kind of a multi-coronary problem. And then when the 4.6 is a, is a, what is called the principal component of regression, which is the, the before the until until the 4.5, we actually use the predictor is as they are. We do not change anything. But what the principal component of regression means that uh, there is the kind of a if we have a too many predictors, one thing we can think about is that we have to try to transform this kind of a feature variable into the maybe a few unrelated uncorrelated variable, which is the principal components like this, right? And then we use the that principal components kind of a value and then try to identify and develop the trained model with the response variable between the principal components and response variable because that principal components can be uh, reflect the variation of the each features included to generate the uh, generate these principal components. And then we can using only these principal components to get the relationship with the response variable. That's the kind of thing. And then I think that from now on, I have to use the textbook by itself. So here is, here is the basic depiction about how interpretation, how principal component regression is about. Because uh, that means it's actually a two step, two step process. One is the calculating the uh, principal components. And the second one is the just develop the regression model using the that principal components as a predictors and then response variable. So that's the uh, things is about here. And then the problem, but in here, the problem is how we can get the optimal kind of a principal components. That means we have to think about the thinking about the cross validations of the model based on the number of principal components we're gonna generate it. So at the bottom in the plot in here, we can see that there is a kind of a in the in here like a 97. Actually what is our goal from the, this plot is that we're going to get the number of components has the minimum RMSE error, which is the 97 in here, in this case. So that means to run the model for, by using the principal component, we have to generating the 97 components. That means maybe I think that in our data set, we, if we have a 200 predictors in the model, maybe by using the principal components, we can actually reduce the dimension down to the 97, which is the half the, half the size of the predictors. So using the, those 97 components, we can run the model instead and then get the result. That's the, how the principal component regression is about. And also, as we all know, in the traditional statistics, we also using the principal components as it is to get the kind of, like a, kind of like a developing the, when we say about the composite indexing system to, to reflect the variance of the predictors among the predictors. 
But anyway, in this case, in the machine learning, we also you think about the pretty, uh, principal component regressions. And then the other way we can do for the, our, our regression is the partial linear squares. The main difference between the partial linear square and then uh, principal component of regression is in, in the partial least square regression, we actually calculate the, generate the principal components and then testing the relationship in here to, to the response variable in advance. And then uh, until we get the optimized result, we keep doing this. And then after that, we actually learn the model again, like a partial linear square kind of effect. So these are the kind of a partial linear square is about. And then when we're looking down here, when we use the, these kind of a partial least square regression effect compared to the principal component at the top here, at the top in the scatter plot, and then a, and then a partial linear square components at the bottom here. Actually, there is a clear difference because uh, in here, when we use the principal component of regression, there is a pretty hard to recognize to the linear regressionship relationship because it's the slope is a pretty, pretty not, not steep. Okay, so that means it is not clear relationship between the principal components and the outcome. But when we use the partial linear scale, uh, uh, square regression, that can be improved like this. It is a more, more stiff and significant slope kind of a relationship, like a positive relationship in this case, gonna be generated compared to the previous one. So that's the kind of a good thing about the partial linear square because uh, compared to the uh, principal component of regressions, partial linear uh, square regression is gonna be generate a much improved our modeling result. That's the kind of thing. And then the final one is the, what is called the feature interpretations. Feature interpretation is about the more like an intuitive kind of a process and also, also quantifiable, quantifiable kind of process, but it is more intuitive because which means that it requires of our, our intuitions to interpret the result. Actually, feature, feature interpretation is about, as you can see at the bottom here, it is a kind of a matter of the calculating the, uh, calculating the variable importance which means the variable importance seeks to identify those variable, which is the more influencer in the model. So that means which variable is the more, in, more contributed to the predicting the our response variable. And then we can actually plotting those results by using the VIP functions. We can calculate those importance and then we can plotting this one as a bar plot by using the sorting the these this, uh, variable importance values. So in this case, when you're looking at the in the x axis, we have a importance score, and then the y axis is a set of the variable. So as you can see, is a uh, interpretation is a very straightforward. So as you can see, is a uh, Grounding living area is the most influential variable that uh, that allows us to the predict the sales price, and then the next one is the total basement square area. Also, is uh, another strong, another most important, second most important variable that we had to use to predict the our response variable, which is the sales price. So we can see. So based on the result, we can see the which one is the most important variable, which one is the least important variable, like a exterior quality variable is the most least important variable to predict our sales prices in this case. That's the how we can reading this one and then how is the that's the inter that's the actual what is called the feature interpretation is about. Is there any questions so far? Anything?
No, no. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So that's the thing. And then actually final thought is just kind of a very simple summary. So we actually covered a lot of things in the chapter four based on the basic principle of the linear regression until to the how we can testing about the best, uh, then uh, get the best model. And uh, what's, the, what's the kind of uh, issues we have to keep in mind to validate our model, like uh, assumptions. And then uh, in that case, how we can try to testing there is also other way to get the uh, understanding the relationship or predict the, our outcome variable, like a principal component or least partial least square and then a feature interpretations. These are also kind of a possible way to developing our model much further to get the more accurate kind of a predictions. So that's the thing. And then this is the end of the chapter four. So any questions for anything so far? No, we're good. Okay, so we actually wrap up the chapter four today. And then next thing, next thing is I think the chapter five, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. so chapter five, can you see the screenshots? Uh, no, no, I, I actually did not share the screenshot. So, okay. Uh, here is the screenshot. So I covered the linear regression. So next one is actually Matteo Vega is gonna be cover the logistic regressions. He's not here today, but I hope that he will be here today, uh, next week. And then I will ask him again about the he really willing to this one or, and then let you know that. And then if he, he cannot, do this one, maybe I have to cover it, but but I'm gonna ask her, uh, ask him, okay? Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much. And then uh, this is the end of the book uh, study group today. And then I will see you next week then. And okay. then I will, I will type end here. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, end. Let, let John know that you know we finished it. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the thing is, I cannot typing it because my Bluetooth keyboard is just disconnected. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, don't worry, I'll, I'll